Proverbs 22, verses 17 through 29. Pay attention and listen to the sayings of the wise. Apply your heart to what I teach. For it is pleasing when you keep them in your heart and have all of them ready on your lips, so that you trust may be in the Lord. I teach you today, even you. Have I not written 30 sayings for you, sayings of counsel and knowledge, teaching you true and reliable words so that you can give sound answers to him who sent you? Do not exploit the poor because they are poor, and do not crush the needy in court. For the Lord will take up their case and will plunder those who plunder them. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one easily angered, or he may learn, you may learn his ways and get yourself ensnared. Do not be a man who strikes hands and pledge or puts up security for debts. If you lack the means to pay, your very bed will be snatched from under you. Do not move an ancient boundary stone set up by your forefathers. Do you see a man skilled in his work? He will serve before kings. He will not serve before obscure men. Amen. Let's pray, please. Father, thank you for this, your holy word and this message. And thank you, Lord, for these people who are here today. Lord, please, may we have eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit has for us this day. May, Lord, you be pleased with us. May we glorify you, Lord, and may, Lord, we be in your perfect will. For it is in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Wise words. God's wise men wrote these truths down so that we could be wise ourselves and so that we could readily share these words with other people. The sayings in Proverbs 27, starting here in verse 17 through 24, 34, were written by men other than King Solomon. These are not King Solomon's Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, if you may not know this, can be broken down into sections. In fact, the first section in, in Proverbs is the first nine chapters. And the second comprises the tenth chapter to the 17th verse of the 22nd chapter. And they contain general proverbs. Uh, generally speaking, but not always, they're usually one verse long. And the third section starts here, where we are today. And it goes to the end of the 24th chapter. The fourth section includes the 25th chapter and the, through the 29th. And then the fifth and final section is the 30th chapter to the very end. Now the subject here in this third section of the book addresses spiritual truths. I think you'll have it, find it very difficult if you try to apply most of these to our physical lives and our physical bodies. Some of them work real well, but most of them are here for spiritual. This is spiritual book. This is God's word. God is spirit. These are spiritual words. So we must consider them that way. And these are spiritual truths. And these spiritual truths are directly related to man's spiritual nature, its moral condition, its interest, and our obligations as spiritual beings. They are much greater, really, worth, really worth very much more than all of the material creation out there. God's words to us are so valuable. To awaken the attention here, the writer or the teacher addresses his students directly. I don't know if you caught that or not, but he's very intent and he's very personal because he uses the pronouns I and you. Which to me, this is understandable when you think about it because ministers must not just simply preach and teach before their hearers, but they must talk to them. They must be able to talk. It's communication. We need to talk to them. Nor is this enough to just preach to them in general terms. We try to be as specific as we can, as we possibly can, but then we have to let the Holy Spirit take over and take charge after that. 
So let's look at a few of these sayings. I'm not going to cover very many, but I want to just look at a couple. First, we need to apply this to life. Apply it to life. The counsels in verse 13 show how to gain God's knowledge. Verse 17 shows us how to do it. It says, pay attention and listen to the sayings of the wise and apply your heart to what I teach. Three very important things. Pay attention, listen, and apply. Note first the authority here. The ability and the integrity of those who taught. Those who teach are those who have been taught and have gained sufficient wisdom from God to be called wise. Starts right here saying the sayings of the wise. Now note next the requirements or the encouragements to you and I. Pay attention, listen, and apply your heart. Oh, I wish I could get everybody to do that to God's Word all the time. Problem is, too many times our, our minds, our hearts, our thoughts are far away. They're not really on God's Word. They're not even on what I'm preaching or what I'm saying. Some of you are looking at me and saying, hey, his glasses are crooked or... Or his suit, is he's, he's got that suit, that same suit he wears all the time. And his hair is messed up. Or you're looking at something, or you're thinking about what you're going to have for dinner. Or, or something instead of God's Word. And the message, you need to listen and think about it. These are the requirements. And these verbs call us to pursue and obey what is presented in the sayings of the wise. Nothing less than our full attention will do if we earnestly and truthfully want to learn from God. Now, if you're not willing to give it your full attention, then that just obviously says you don't really want to learn from God. You must give your full attention. We are to apply, to uh, lean our head forward so we don't miss a word. Now, that's really what it means uh, we're to hear it and take it all in and then think about it. Many times I'm looking out there at, at you and, and I look at your faces and, and I look at you and, um, okay, I know I'm not the greatest thing to look at and I don't expect that. But I expect you to at least be attentive and thinking about, and I can tell, generally speaking, I can look at you and tell if you're listening and you're thinking. That's, that's not a great talent I have because if you were up here, you could do the same thing. You know who I'm talking about? You know, you can look at somebody and you can tell if they're really listening to you or not. Because if, they got a, if they're daydreaming, they're sort of, they're not even looking at you. You know, it's like they're looking right straight through you. And So I really think we really need, though, based on this, we really do need to give our attention. And we're to apply it and to lean forward. That's what this is. It's like listening, you know. You really have an interest. And we to think about it and we're to apply or to grasp this. To hear it, to take it in. We're to apply it, to grasp the meaning and put it in our minds and use our whole intellect, our whole being to decide how to put it to work. When we hear this, we, we think, okay, okay, this is... Well, what do I do with it? These are not words that just we hurriedly read through or we just hurry up and read through. Oh, okay, I read it, Pastor. I'm good enough. I read it. That's not what these are for. We are thus powerfully, I think, encouraged here to get wisdom and grace by laying hold of the wise sayings, the sayings of the wise, both written and preached. We are encouraged to get the knowledge which this book gives men of good and evil. It also gives us knowledge of sin and duty. It also gives us knowledge of rewards and punishment. 
There's lots of knowledge here if we truly seek it out and we want it and we want to apply it. The ear, the chief receptacle of wisdom, must be bowed down in humility and in serious attention to these words, to this knowledge. And the heart, the very center of our thinking, the very center of us that makes choices, the very center of us that decides, we must apply this in faith and in love and in intense con consideration in everything we do of these words. For the ear will not serve without the heart. Most of you wives know what I'm talking about. Your husband's got his mind on something else and you're talking to him and he don't hear a word you say. He actually hears it, right? That sound that you say goes in the ear, it actually vibrates the, the eardrum. That nerve actually goes to the brain. He hears it. He's just not paying any attention. Children are apt to be the same way, are they not? And of course, husbands, I must admit, wives can be that way sometimes too. But you know, the, we, we husbands, we get blamed for it most of the time. Most of, and that's probably true. I'll admit it. I admit my sin. I confess my sin before the Lord. I'm not listening many times when she's talking to me. I know she said something. And if I say, honey, what did you say? She knows I'm not listening. I'm not saying nothing. You know, it's like you convict yourself. You plead the Fifth Amendment, you know. And don't say anything. It's better to say nothing. Yes, dear. People often say to me, they say, I wish I knew what God wants me to do. Maybe some of you have thought that. I wish I knew what God wants me to do. If you've heard those words or thought those words, you're not alone because many people do. My experience, though, is that no matter how much I have longed for God to tell me what to do. I've never heard him audibly tell me anything with my ear. When he speaks to me, I have heard him much louder, much stronger and louder in my heart and in my soul. Nor does God tell me in prayer exactly the next thing to do. Has God ever told you, this is what you're going to do, this is what you... Do you get that kind of answers you, to me, I think discerning or understanding God's will often requires a, an ongoing process. As I live my life, He is leading me step by step as I try to walk in the light of His Word. And you know, sometimes it takes faith to go down that road because you don't know what's down there. God didn't tell you, okay, there's something down here at the end of the road I want you to go. He just says, go down the road. And you'll find out what's there when God's ready for you to find out. That's why it takes faith. It takes faith. In this verse here, the book of Proverbs helps us to learn how to discern and understand what God wants us to do. We are to do so by paying attention and listening and applying God's teachings to our daily life. This process really demands active listening, really being acceptable to God speaking to us. We listen for God's direction by reading and studying Scripture and by praying and by worshiping. Let me tell you, if you just walk outside and you're sitting there looking up at the sky and I walk out and I say, what are you doing? You say, I'm listening for God to tell me something. You're wrong. Listening means you read God's word and you pray and you worship. And that's when God speaks to us. We also get God's direction by hearing God's word being taught to us. It may be in Bible studies or 
in conversation with Christians that we know are faithful, maybe even sermons. Then while we apply the Word of God to our lives, God, He continues to lead us. You know, I am a firm believer that if you say, well, God's not leading me and I don't know where to go. Well, you know, first you have to take that first step. Maybe you've not been following him. Maybe you're so far off the path, you've got to get back on the path that he wants you to get back on. Then he will lead you. We get so far away from God and then we blame God for it. The truth is, it's us. God will lead you if you will let him lead you. But you need to stay in the path he puts you on. As we listen for God to speak to us through our daily spiritual disciplines, we actually build confidence and trust in him the more he leads us. Praise his name. God reveals his way and, and we learn to follow his will. As we listen and understand and apply his word, he proves himself to be a wise counselor and God in every step of faith that we take. Have you ever been worried and done something? You knew that's what God wanted you to do, but you were concerned, you were worried, and then later on everything worked perfect and it was wonderful. And you're back and you say, why was I worried about it? Because that's God's work. Okay, maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're not listening to God. You're so far away, you haven't heard him recently. We should pray this way. We should pray, Father, speak to me through your word. For I have determined to follow your will. And then ask him, say, help me to, to listen to understand and to apply what you say so that I can trust in you more. That's a good prayer. But you have to mean it when you say it. It must come from your heart. Number two, reasons. Reasons. For the encouragements are given in verses 18 and 19. Verse 18 states that laying hold of God's word brings delight. And it actually causes goodness within us. It says, for it is pleasing when you keep them in your heart and have all of them ready on your lips. What a wonderful thought, really, if you think about it. Listening to and knowing God's word causes pleasing and good or delight to occur within us. Now notice something. It doesn't say good and things are going to happen outside of us, does it? It says those things are going to happen inside of us. There's a big difference. Big difference between what happens outside of us and inside of us. The question is, what's most important to you? What happens inside you or what happens outside you? I'm here to tell you that if it's proper inside you, it doesn't matter what happens outside you. But things could be really good on the outside if things are bad inside, you're not going to enjoy it. These verses encourage me to stay in the habit of studying God's Word. The idea of having His Word ready on the lips, on my lips, that, that should convince us and encourage us of the importance of maintaining a habit of studying God's Word. Nothing chases away biblical illiteracy like remembering Scripture. Now, memorizing Scripture is wonderful, but don't let that stop you if you think, I can't memorize good. At least study it and know what it says and know the principles and know about where to find it. So keep them in your heart. 
or build them into your life and speech with diligence so that they become your foundation, your spiritual foundation. God's words are to fill us until they overflow us from our lips. The lips are how we communicate, their vehicle of communication. If we articulate what we have learned, then the cycle of learning can be repeated. If I tell you what I've learned, then you can take it and you can teach someone else what you have learned. The learner can become a teacher by being able to teach others. Verse 9 reveals that learning scripture yields trust or faith in the Lord. Excuse me, 19. Verse 19 says, so that your trust may be in the Lord, I have taught you today, even you. I love that part where it says, even you, because I'm thinking, is he talking to me? And he says, even you. I think that's, you know, that's God really working. And I, and I think God's word's amazing sometimes. Because sometimes I'm not sure he's talking to me. But when he says, even you, after already saying you, there's no doubt that he's talking to me. When you read it, he's talking to you, even you. Even you. We need to. The first part here says the purpose. The first part of 19 introduces a purpose. Of the instruction that follow. The purpose of these teachings is that your trust may be in the Lord. The outcome of knowledge and counsels and truth is to bring about your trust in God Almighty Yahweh. I, the teacher, have instructed made you to know what I have learned from experience and study. That's what he's saying. The keeping of these instructions will develop the faith of those who are subject to the rule of God. It's pleasing to keep the sayings in your heart and to be able to quote and talk about them or have them on your lips. And do you know why? It's because they encourage other people to trust in the Lord. That's why it's pleasing to the heart of a Christian to be able to give those words, to give God's words, because you're actually encouraging them to trust God too. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Number three, answers and truth. Verse 20 affirms the good counsel and solid knowledge that these written Proverbs contain. It says, have I not written 30 sayings for you? Sayings of counsel and knowledge? God's words have been recorded and they are repeatedly studied, studied over and over and read over and over and it has a great purpose. That purpose is create confidence and trust in Him and may have it greater depth and greater power. Hallelujah. You know, it says, have I not written? That emphasizes that the teacher has taken pains to write this counsel and to write this knowledge out so that you have a precise list of the 30 sayings to write them on your heart. The counsel in 30 sayings comes from the knowledge of the wise men whose words were true. A reason for the writing is stated again in the next verse. And it's so that the learner can give sound answers to those who God sends him. Verse 21 even reflects God's concern that the message and its wisdom be entrusted to those who are capable of delivering them accurately. It says, teaching you to be honest and to speak the truth so that you may bring back truthful reports to those you serve. You see, it's sort of a double task. It's a double task of the messenger is to learn first to learn correctly 
the teacher's message and to be able to see what he learns from his given task is truthfully given so that he can answer his teacher. Disciples or students are sent out. They're sent out with the truth in order to become skillful in the use of God's word. And thus they gain the approval of the teacher. Well, who is the ultimate teacher? God. God is the ultimate teacher. He used men to put these words down, yes, but they were put down as spiritual through the Holy Spirit, and God is really the teacher. He's the one we're responsible to. He taught these wise men these sayings, and we are to gain God's approval. You see, the words of truth here literally means bring back truthful reports. The same word is translated truth and truthful in that verse, verse 21. It's the same word, same Hebrew word. The two uses of truth underscore the utter reliability of the teacher's sayings. In other words, th this sort of underscores and points to the fact of how reliable the word of God is. It is reliability that is matched, should be matched in the recital of them from the disciple or the student, the teacher. A teacher of God's wisdom attempts to qualify his student or disciple through the understanding and application of these words, the Proverbs. He does this so that the student might have the right answer for those who question him and go to him for counsel. And when you teach your student, your disciple, they become a teacher of truth themselves. That's the whole point to the Proverbs. That's why we have them, brothers and sisters. These God-given Proverbs come to us so that we can teach them. But we must know them ourselves. And once we know them, once we see them, once we meditate on them, once we have them in our hearts, then God uses us to teach others. The final line of verse 21 casts light on the background of the 30 sayings. It says, bring back truthful reports to those you serve. That is a commission, and we represent those you serve. In diplomatic activities, we are it. Hallelujah. The student or the disciple is clearly being trained for official responsibilities where he or she is not to freelance or to uh, in the negotiations but to carry information from God, God's information, truthfully, precisely from one person to another person. That's what it's all about. The more a Christian knows of these spiritual truths, the more settled and the more un unwavering and the stronger our faith is. The more you know these words, the more they're in you, the stronger your faith. They have the witness in themselves that God is true. They know in whom they have believed in. They are like a tree rooted by the river, the water of life. They stand not in the wisdom of man, but we stand in the wisdom and the power of God. So in conclusion, the purpose of this teaching is found in verse 19, I've already told you, so that your trust may be in the Lord I have taught you today, even you. And I pray that this will be the outcome of all my instructions. Each of us needs to get alone by ourselves with God. And we need to be in His good graces as He enables us. That's very important. 
if our prayer is cold, if we have a cold prayer life, or if the reading of his word is stale, or we rarely do it, or we do it in the wrong way, or if our spiritual strength is weak, if our testifying about God is unfruitful, it may be, just maybe, it is because we're not abiding in the truths of God and the God of truth. We need to abide in Him, in His Word, in His truth, so that He, who is the God of truth, will abide in us. Pray to God. Pray to Him and reveal His counsels and His life imparted knowledge. Ask for Him to impart it to you, to ask for it, to genuinely desire it. How many of us really pray for God's wisdom? How many of us really pray, Lord, open my heart to you and your word? James 1, 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. A little part of that a lot of people miss is, A lot of people say, well, I can't pray that way because I'm too much of a sinner. But notice what it says. He says, God gives to those generously without what? Finding fault. So we don't let our sins and the fact that we're unworthy should not stop us from asking. Let God make the decision, not you. Let God make the decision. Let us pray.